Hello, my name is Sarah and I work with the Living Archives Project where we are collecting stories from various communities around Charlotte-Mecklenburg County and how they were impacted by COVID-19. Today is December 1st, 2022, and this week there have been 93 reported cases of COVID-19 in the Charlotte-Mecklenburg County area, which actually shows a decrease of 27% over the last two weeks. Therefore, we are both comfortable not wearing a mask. Alicia, would you introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Alicia Lackey. Um, I am a black woman. I'm wearing a teal sweater and I have long braided hair. Um, I am smiling. I have a really big and bright smile. Yes, you do, Alicia. <laughs> you have a lovely smile. Alicia, can you share a little bit about who you are. Sure. Um, I am a single mother to a very busy three-year-old boy. His name is Chancellor. Mm -hmm. I also work for Charlotte Mecklenburg Library as the branch manager of Allegra Westbrook's Regional Library. I've worked with the library for going on eight years now. Um, and librarianship is, it's a wonderful profession. I really enjoy it. Um, I am very family oriented. Um, I help to take care of my aging mother. And before becoming a mother myself, um, I helped my sister to raise my niece, who is now 21 years old. Wow. That's amazing. I can definitely tell you are family oriented. Mm -hmm. um, Alicia, tell me, how did you get involved in the library or as a librarian, per se? Um, well, I used to work at UNC Charlotte. Um, I worked at UNC Charlotte in the Department of Languages and Culture Studies as the um, computer lab manager. And I had a really um, kind, immediate supervisor who always looked for opportunities for other people. And she thought that I had this great capacity to like learn and help others with their learning endeavors. And so she always said, you should be a librarian. And I didn't think that it was really the right career for me, um, but she was persistent. She even helped me to find a scholarship opportunity that allowed me to pursue my master's degree essentially for free. So um, I was able to go to UNCG and earn my my master's in library and information studies over the course of two years and then ultimately I ended up here in Charlotte Mecklenburg Library. That's awesome. Are you from Charlotte? I'm from Statesville, okay. which is, you know, just about 40 miles north of Charlotte. I've never lived more than 45 minutes away from wow. home. Wow. That's that, mm -hmm. that basically makes you a native though. Uh, I You're guess. You're so close. I guess. Statesville is a lot different is from it? Charlotte. Absolutely. Tell me, what are some of the differences? I haven't been to Statesville. Well, Statesville is, um, it's very small. Okay. Very small. Um, if you think of it in terms of how many Walmarts there are in Charlotte, we only have one in Statesville. Okay. And there's only one Chick-fil-A. So okay. <laughs> if a town can be supported by one Walmart and one Chick-fil-A, it's got to be pretty yeah. small. Yeah. Um, there's actually only one high school that um, is inside of the city limits. No the rest of the other three high schools are in the county. Okay. So <laughs> that could give you... An idea of just how small yeah, it is. Yeah, definitely a small town, though. That's so cool. Maybe one day I'll have to visit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Who knows? I like small towns. Sometimes they have this just feeling about them, the small town life. <laughs> Who knows? I will show you around if oh, you come. thanks, Alicia. <laughs> it won't take long. <laughs> Not very long. So you have a three-year-old, yes. Chancellor. Yes. Tell me about Chancellor. Ooh, how much time do we have? <laughs> um, he's amazing. He's really, really smart. Um, he loves to talk and sing. And right now he's taking an interest in math, okay. numbers. Look at that. Patterns are a really big deal to him. And he's trying to figure out addition. So that's really cool. He also thinks he's an official member of the Paw Patrol. So he goes on missions and adventures every oh single day. Oh, my God. Um, what a I just see lots and lots of VR visits in yeah. our future because oh, he likes no. to like jump off the furniture and all the things. But he is amazing. He's my little broke best friend. You know, we yeah. hang out. Oh, I love that. 
And so he's three. Yes. And we, that means he was probably born mm-hmm. around the time of COVID. Yes. What was that like? So Chancellor was born in November of 2019. Um, my maternity leave ended in February of 2020. So I was just returning to work and getting back into the swing of things at work and adjusting to my new life as a working single parent um, as things were starting to shut down, as we were starting to learn that COVID was going to be happening. So um, the majority of his life has been lived during the pandemic. Yeah. Yes. Oh, my goodness. And so you weren't really impacted by restrictions in terms of his birth. No. Because it happened right before mm-hmm. the kind of lockdown. Right. But what was that like for you who just started back to work and then to be told you're going home? Mm-hmm. What was that like? Well, I didn't really understand what the stay at home orders meant. And Mecklenburg County was, I think, the first county in North Carolina to um, get have like the the lockdown stay at home orders. We knew that they were coming. Um, And for some reason, in my mind, I took it to mean that I wouldn't be able to travel between my house and my parents house in Statesville. And so. I, and and I was very, um, I guess, hopeful that the lockdown would only be two weeks and mm-hmm. then it would be over and we'd go back to life as normal. So I decided that I would quarantine with my parents in Statesville because I didn't want to be stuck in Charlotte with, you know, a, what, 16 week old infant yeah. and two dogs and myself so I just I didn't really know what to expect and so I just knew that I didn't want to be alone so um that was the decision that I made was to quarantine with my parents and and my sister and my niece um she her college shut down so she ended up coming home as well um for the duration of that time Wow. Yeah. So you were all together. Yes. In Statesville. Mm-hmm. And tell me a little bit about that. So um, my dad was ill at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, I always pronounce it incorrectly, but he had um, um, he had Gilliam Barre Barre disease, um, and it was um, something that we're not quite sure how he contracted it, but it essentially renders a person it kind of kills the nerve endings all throughout a person's body so it rendered him paralyzed he was quadriplegic um it's very rare and most people who get it make a full recovery and go on to you know resume their you know pre-conditioned lives unfortunately that wasn't the case for my dad um he was very much codependent on others for care um he required a lot of care um and he had been in that state for a number of years he initially became ill in 2015 so now we're in 2020 um he had been in and out of different healthcare facilities, but my mom, you know, they've been married for 45 plus years. She wanted him home. So mm. she was caring for him in the home um, along with with nursing professionals. So um, it was a lot. There were essentially five adults because my niece is, you know, 18. So she's an adult, five adults, an infant two pit bulls, um, nurses, and you name it. It was just, it was, it was a lot going on. Um, um, There have been a lot happening too. Um, Just over the course of those months, we saw things like Ahmaud Arbery and um, George Floyd and just all of those different things have been happening in the news because I spent my maternity leave at my parents' house. And so um, I spent a lot of time with my dad. You know, he had been really excited to to meet my son. But there had just been so much bad news. You know, <laughs> I'm a big fan of Hallmark movies, so I tried to watch Hallmark movies whenever <laughs> we could just to get a break. Yeah. But um, I think that the 
onset of COVID-19 really took a toll on my dad and took a toll on his mental health um, because, you know, he was already in poor health. And then all of these negative things just kept happening. Um, So shortly after the pandemic started, he did pass away. Um, He had a heart attack. One of the things that had been um, really concerning for my mom was, you know, no one can get sick because if we brought COVID to my dad, the likelihood that he would survive it, you know, it was just unlikely. Um, He had been on a ventilator before, but at the time of his passing, he was no longer vent dependent. Like he had a lot of health complications. So um, the onset of the pandemic and the shutdown did buy our family some uninterrupted family time. Of course, we didn't know, you know, that it was going to be the time of his passing, but it put, you know, the now six of us or eight of us, when you count the dogs, under one roof together. And we were able to spend, you know, the bulk of his last days with him. Um, Unfortunately, because of the stay at home orders and the, the shutdown, he did pass away alone in the hospital Um, without the benefit of my mom being by his side. Um, Our family... It's okay. Um, Our family... We were very persistent um, with the local hospital in being able to have a visit to say final goodbyes because, you know... He he had coded a few times. And so my mom had to make the decision as to whether or not, you know, she would sign a DNR on his behalf. And um, like I said, they had been married for over 45 years. I think it was 48. It would have been 48 years when he passed. And so, you know, she was adamant, I'm not making this decision without talking to my husband. I need to be allowed to see him. And we thought that because of the exceptions that they were making, you know, for end of life or if someone is incapacitated or so for the hospital that she should have the right to be with him and they just wouldn't allow it. But, you know, we petitioned hospital admin and just the doctors and charge nurses and everyone. And eventually, you know, they heard us and allowed us, or well, allowed my mom to, um, to visit. And then, you know, little by little, we were able to, you know, get myself in and my sister in and my, and my niece in. Um, <clears throat> so my son, he was with his paternal grandparents, Um, And we were all able to, like, gather around the bed and talk to him. Um, We FaceTimed my grandmother, my dad's mother, um, and his siblings so that he would have an opportunity to, like, see them and they could say their goodbyes. Um, He has a cousin with whom he was raised who was more like a brother. Um, We were able to, you know, call him on speakerphone. He um, was battling I think stomach cancer at the time and he had just had Mm -hmm. surgery and you know they had gotten all of the cancer so he got to tell my dad you know that he was cancer free Mm -hmm. um we called my son's paternal grandparents on FaceTime so that he could see the baby um and they told us you know this is just going to be a short visit when it's time to go it's time to go um and it's very likely that, you know, the next time you visit, he'll be deceased. And so that was April 4th of 2020. April 5th of 2020 was my dad's 67th birthday. So we called the hospital and we had nurses put us on speakerphone and we just, you know, talked to him and the plan was for him to be moved to hospice. Mm -hmm. Um, And we talked to him over the phone. He couldn't speak back to us, but they told us, you know, he was looking around and he could hear us. And um, at about 116 on April 6th, 2020, the day that he was to be transported, or transported to hospice he passed away in the week in the morning in the early morning hours so my mom and I were able to go over and kind of you know 
sit with him and you know she was able to have her last moments and it really made me mad if I'm honest yeah. because I get the protocols I get the procedures but I don't understand what the difference was between us visiting him with him while he was still alive than sitting with his body like we were still in the same space you know and I know there's a reason. I don't know that I will ever understand that reason or that I'll ever agree with that reason. But like my parents got married when my mom was 17 and my dad was he was already 19 because he had had his birthday. My mom was 17. She turned 18 two days later. and They got married and it's they had essentially lived their whole lives together. They grew up in the same neighborhood like they had raised a family and she was denied the opportunity to be with him when he passed away. Like, it seems unfair. Mm -hmm. um, we had a COVID funeral. So at that time, um, you know, only 50 people were allowed to attend funeral services. Masks were not as big a thing as they became at that time. Um, so we didn't require masks, but it was a very intimate funeral. And I say intimate because my dad came from a big family. My mom came from a big family. My dad was a member of a fraternity and a member of a Masonic Lodge and a member of the church. And he was a retired school teacher who had like hundreds if not more students who remembered him fondly and so there were so many people who under normal circumstances would have attended this funeral service who couldn't um it really I don't think that there was anyone outside of the family in attendance um with the exception of some clergy like even their congregation didn't get to it like the only people in the congregation who attended the funeral service were people who were actively involved in the funeral service so a few people sang from the church so they were there and a few people served as ushers so they were there yeah. and that was that was it you know and and he was a founding member of the church you know that they attended but that's that's what that was like. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even remember what the question was yeah, anymore. It must have been so frustrating, though. I can't mm -hmm. imagine. Um, you and I talked about this in the past, but mm -hmm. we both lost our fathers in that time frame, and and I'm so sorry. I truly am. Thank you. It's it's okay. Um, I just again like. I just, if people might say it's cliche, but I do think that he was literally heartbroken at kind of the way things were going just with society and politics and then this big ambiguous disease that nobody really knows anything about was coming. And and he was tired. Yeah, mm -hmm. I can imagine. Man, I can imagine watching the news and seeing all that happened to George Floyd and to so many others mm -hmm. and just that's so heartbreaking what was that like for you so um the way the house is situated like my dad had his own room and again I spent my maternity leave there so you know Chancellor and I would sit with him pretty much all day and up until um up until like the cardiac arrest, the initial cardiac arrest, he had started asking me, will you, will y'all spend the night? Will y'all spend the night with me? Mm -hmm. So, um, Chancellor had a pack and play in my dad's bedroom. So I would put Chancellor to sleep in the pack and play. And then I would sleep on the sofa in the room with him and we would have sleepovers. And sometimes he'd be like, well, let the baby sleep with me. And I'd let like I position Chancellor very carefully in bed with him and make sure that I stay awake. And yeah. then like as soon as my dad would fall asleep, I'd like take him out, you know, and put yeah. him in the pack and play. But Chancellor and I, we spent a ton of time with him um, and almost looking back it feels like maybe we subconsciously knew that we didn't have a lot of time um but we watched the um George Floyd 
cases or the George Floyd incident unfold. And we saw like the Ahmaud Arbery incident unfold. And for me, it was difficult because I was for the first time the mother of a black son. Mm -hmm. And so it put all of those things into greater perspective for me. And it made me think about, well, what lessons will I teach? Um, what will we do? There was a house that was being built in um, my parents' neighborhood. And um, I remember reading that as the media or whomever was trying to paint a picture of Amar Arbery, that I remember reading that he had been trespassing the day before um, in a, on a construction site and surveillance videos showed he and a number of people kind of like meandering around this property that was under construction. It was, I believe it was a residential property. And I remember thinking, well, my God, Chance and I take a walk to this house that's being built down the street and around the corner every single day. Now, granted, we haven't gone in, but I've looked in the windows like I've done this very thing yeah. that people are trying to villainize, villainize this man for. And so it just really gave me pause and it gave me more perspective on something that I really had not a huge frame of reference for before. Um, and it just... I know that my dad, um, I know that he had concerns because he was kind of hot headed in his day, you know, <laughs> and before, you know, I would think about what would happen, you know, to my dad, my uncles, my cousins. I don't have any brothers. Um, I remember being a kid, seeing Rodney King, like before media was as prevalent as, as it is now. And it's just like you can't get away from it now and nothing really seems to be changing. So felt very uncomfortable. I guess it's the short version, the short answer. Yeah. Very, very uncomfortable. And it's something that I try not to think about now because he's so small, but you know, he's going to get big. And even now he's tall for his age. Like, He's over three and a half feet tall and he's on he just turned three and, you know, he wears a size five T, which is like the size of a small kindergartner, you know, and and I just feel like when people look at him, they might not see a baby, you know, they might not see a preteen mm -hmm. or or whomever, but. We will figure it out. And if if I'm hopeful or naive, you know, I can't think that maybe things will get better for him, but we will figure it out. Mm -hmm. We'll try to. Yeah. Well, I sit with you in hope. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so now after that entire experience mm -hmm. of transition and loss and how how is Chancellor doing in it does he go to preschool? How is he doing? How is he adjusting? Um he goes to preschool. He goes to daycare, excuse me. He goes okay. to a small in home daycare here in Charlotte. Um I think he is the big man on campus. He is very social Daycare is his favorite place in the world. He gets excited to go there. Um, he's getting out of the separation anxiety phase in that I can drop him off more places now. But there was a time where preschool was the only, or daycare was the only place that I could drop him off. And, you know, he'd be so excited and, you know, he wouldn't even want me to walk him to the door. He was just like, no, no. Aww. Bye. See you later. And, you know, I'd have to stand on the sidewalk <laughs> while he walked up the stairs and took himself to the front door. But Mr. but he huh? yes, <laughs> very independent. Um, you know, he I worked for the library yeah. for a very long time. He didn't get to go to story time because there was no story time. Yeah. And like what librarian doesn't want their kid to go to story time, yeah. you know, Um his first birthday party was very COVID friendly. Um, 
I had a, I, I wanted him to have a birthday party. I didn't want him to miss out on that. So I kept the guest list very small. I asked that all of the two parent households please only send one parent. I asked that older siblings not come. I asked that all adults wear masks and the kids had happy meals that they could. The idea was that they would take them with them, you know, after the party was over and eat at home. So, um, I think, you know, he's he's adjusting. He doesn't know any differently. One of the things that I always thought was funny was people would be like, or people would say, these kids probably wonder why we're all walking around in these masks. And I'm like, these kids don't know any different. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a tr- I mean, that's what they were raised in. They don't, we know the difference, mm-hmm. but they don't. Man, has he been able to attend a story time since then? Oh, yes. Yay. Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> we we get out more now. I was very reluctant to be social for a very long time. Um, but we get out now. We spend time with family now. We're very cognizant of, you know, not feeling well and staying home when we're sick. Um I actually had COVID twice and he's had COVID once. Um, And the first time that I had COVID, um, I was advised to treat him as if he was a presumed positive case. So we quarantined together and I wore a mask even though, um, and I wore a mask and we went about our daily lives with some modifications. Mm -hmm. It's like the rules kept changing, you know, so, and, and we're just trying to like, live our lives you know yeah. as safely as we can but still enjoy our lives so we get out now and he definitely goes to story time yeah. now mm-hmm. how to, as a single parent mm-hmm. how was that for you once the restrictions were kind of uplifted and you know minimized mm-hmm. a little bit and you had to go back to work well how how did you transition? So he was able to go back to daycare okay. um, with, um, or excuse me, he was, wait, hmm, no, he wasn't in daycare then. He had a babysitter. Okay. So he was able to go back to his babysitter and, you know, I masked at the babysitters and, you know, our visits were brief. It was drop off, pick up, like hand the child through the door um if ever I felt like he was sick or the slightest sniffle I would keep him home I wouldn't send him you know to the babysitter because she also had a small child at the time and then um you know we went a whole year with the babysitter the the plan had always been that when he was 12 months old he would go into daycare so he started daycare when there were still some restrictions and so like for a very long time I wasn't even allowed inside of daycare um and there's still very little very limited parent traffic into daycare it's like you come in if you have to (laughs) um so it would be like drop off at the front door hand sanitized check hands sanitized and um temperature checks you know and then same thing pick up pick up at the front door like I never crossed the threshold yeah. um because that was a requirement and parents had to be masked and once the children I think were two years old the children had to start wearing masks but then when things tapered off there were no more masks mm-hmm. and then so so he there was a time where he was wearing a mask for a little bit at wow. school um and I tried to find the cute ones that maybe he would want to wear. And sometimes he did and sometimes he did it. Yeah. Um, so it's just been one of those things. And we even had um, just one daycare closing due to COVID. Well, actually, there were two. There was one in the beginning and then one later. But fortunately, I've got friends who are parents who's kids classrooms were having to quarantine like you know yeah. every so like every few months like those kids were out of school but I didn't have that issue and I'm I'm thankful that I didn't um when I had COVID um the 
rules surrounding working from home had been modified because of COVID. So I was able to continue working. Um, and, you know, that was very helpful. Um, it was a, I was able to kind of have a little bit of a break <laughs> or an escape from COVID because I could catch up on email or work on projects and things like that. Um, I do um, have asthma and some other underlying health conditions. So I was always very anxious, like I'm okay now, but is this going to get worse? Yeah. Fortunately for me, it never got to be super serious. I never had to be hospitalized or anything like that. And Chancellor, had it not been for the test, you wouldn't even know that he was COVID positive. He was just his regular normal self. Oh, wow. That's incredible, especially with asthma and other things. Sometimes it can be really scary, mm -hmm. you know, especially with how the news was sharing about other people's experiences. Right. And so right. But it's so interesting how everybody's different. And everybody's different. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, I had a cousin to be hospitalized um, over Thanksgiving of last year um, with a severe case of COVID. Um, my cousin ended up making a full recovery, but it was very, very scary. Yeah, mm -hmm. I can't imagine. Wow. Um, so now as chancellors in preschool, or sorry, daycare, I keep saying preschool, but daycare, um, I just want to keep them a baby. I know. It's daycare. I know. <laughs> For sure. And you are full-time working. Mm -hmm. And how has that been for you? Working, how or just this the last few years? As it relates to COVID? Yeah, or? as it relates to COVID and you. And I know you transitioned from uh, a librarian into the branch manager mm -hmm. position. And so what was that transition like for you? Um, it has been great. It's been great. So um, with with Chancellor in daycare, it's been challenging because it is a small environment. It's a home daycare. The population is small. Um, and so it if if one child is sick, they're probably all sick. So um his teacher, the daycare owner, has been very, um, you know, very adamant that if the children are sick, keep them home. So, you know, Chancellor is prone to ear infections. So even though you can't really catch an ear infection, an ear infection can sometimes present as extra sneezing or runny noses or irritability or in Chance's case, even coughing like you think, what is going on with this kid? Oh, that's an ear infection. So, you know, there have been times where he's had to be home, you know, because he's had COVID-like symptoms. And that's been challenging. Um, but fortunately, I've been able to um, use, you know, leave as appropriate to be with him. Um, I have a great support system. Um Again, Chancellor's babysitter is still very active in his life. So, um, you know, I think there was a time where he was where all the kids might have had to quarantine for a while because there was a COVID positive case. Fortunately, each time um, Chancellor tested positive, the other children weren't considered close contacts because of the timeline you remember how they used to be those yeah. timelines yeah. and when you last were in mm -hmm. I, I don't know um but like you know as long as like he was nearing the end of his quarantine window or there were no um symptoms no fever like his babysitter was very helpful um I have an aunt here in Charlotte who um stays at home who's been super helpful and will like step in when mm -hmm. he can't go to daycare um, my best friend is amazing. Um, my work schedule here is such that I get off at eight o'clock on Monday nights. So she picks them up every Monday evening and takes them home. And then when I get off at 
eight o'clock I go pick him up and she has children as well she has a middle schooler and a kindergartner and um you know she's always very cognizant of okay are my kids sick is my household healthy like and you know they even had um a bout with COVID and it was like I was one of the first calls she made I can't get chance this week we've got COVID I'm like no problem I'm so sorry I'm so nope it's all good we'll figure it out so I do have a good support system um and it's interesting because I mean I have a I guess are we post COVID (laughs) um we're still in the midst of it right but it's definitely I just I I have people to really show up for me in the pandemic so it makes me hopeful that I'll still have like great support moving forward um I know that I'm fortunate though I know that everybody doesn't have that um but I I am thankful and I'm super appreciative of the people who kind of stand in and and help us out a lot so yeah that's amazing uh before we started the recorded time we did this activity together yes hand map Mm -hmm. is there anything from your hand map alicia that you wanted to share with us um (laughs) sure um so the words that i use to describe myself (laughs) i didn't know i'd have to say this out loud you don't have to i'm gonna say it anyway i'm gonna say it anyway (laughs) and i'll tell you why so the things that i use to describe the words that i use to describe myself are mother generous smart busy and considerate Um, And so the word that I was kind of reluctant to say out loud is smart, because who says I'm smart? Um, But one of the things about COVID um, and my mom and my sister and I, we've talked about this a lot at length and my best friend um, is how hard it's been to navigate all of the information, all of the misinformation, all of the guidelines, all of the tips and strategies how hard that's been to navigate as an intelligent person, Mm -hmm. as a person with access to resources. So I can only imagine, you know, how difficult it would be for someone. And I'm I'm not saying that, I mean, intelligence, it's, it's different things to different people, but for someone with less access to resources, or maybe someone is a genius, but there's a language barrier in the way the information is being disseminated. Like how hard was it to navigate with tools? And I mean, it just seems like it would be even harder to navigate without access to certain resources. Um, So I just I really think about like the elderly, you know, I don't don't even want to go into it, but it's just I just imagine that it 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 I think it would have had to have been difficult Mm -hmm. or more difficult for some people. So um, the three things that I took away from COVID was family time, personal space and perspective. Um, I try to think about not only how things affect me, but how things can potentially affect others and kind of how I govern myself with that perspective in mind. Um, I am not a hugger. I actually hate hugs. Really? Yes. Makes me feel, don't touch my, don't please don't touch my body. So um, this feels really um, insignificant, but I liked that. I could not be hugged and people not consider me rude during the pandemic. Like that's totally valid. Yeah. And, you know, in times of like grief or loss or bereavement, like everybody wants to give you a hug, Mm -hmm. but nobody could hug me because of social distancing. (laughs) When my dad died, I, I appreciated that um, because it can be awkward to ask people, please don't try to comfort me. Yeah. <laughs> this makes me feel awkward. It only helps you. Um, and then, of course, I explain the family time. Um, some of the journeys that I've been on is that of a caregiver because um, I did help to care for my dad um, in his illness. And mm-hmm. um, now my mom, I think... 
as a result of being a caregiver for so long. Now she's having some health challenges. And of course, I'm taking care of my child. I am a professional. So I have had a professional path, a professional journey that I'm very much enjoying. And then I'm also on the journey of conscious parenting, Mm -hmm. um, which has been rewarding and challenging in its own right. And then the three words that I associated um, with the COVID-19 pandemic or the three words that I thought about were anxiety, loss, and uncertainty. Wow. Thank you for sharing, Alicia. Oh, you're welcome. You know, to respect your time and, and honor you, I will follow up with just one last question. Sure. Is there a story or an experience over the last two, three years that you would like to share with us? A story or an experience over the last two, three years? (sighs) Um, I think, I don't, I don't really know. Um, Most of my life right now revolves around parenting. I want to do that right, and I want to do that well. So um, doing that has been marked by COVID-19 because the majority of my parenting, of course, has been in a pandemic. Um, But I've tried to make the best of it try to give my child (laughs) opportunities um we took swim lessons and I bought like this mask it was like a plastic mask off of Amazon and I like show up to the pool and I'm the only parent like in this mask and so I wore it like maybe the first two lessons and then in all the subsequent lessons I ditched it because it was uncomfortable and I felt awkward and I looked awkward. So like, but I would stay away from everyone in the pool. But, you know, at least we were there, you know, and we were trying and he was getting, you know, his socialization with other kids and learning the safety, you know, water safety. So that was something, Um, you know, I tried to I've tried to just give him, you know, as many as as many experiences in ways that I deem safe, you know, over the course of these two years or three years. And just, I don't know, like it's cliche, but it could be over in a minute for any one of us. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to live well and, you know, enjoy the time that I have, you know, being a mother and just, going forward you know I don't know if that really answers your question but it's not cliche at all and and it's truth and and thank you thank you for sharing your story with us and for blessing us with your journey and um, yeah thank you Sarah for the opportunity thank you